Imagine a country where giant corporations dominate entire sectors of the economy through monopolistic practices. Hugely wealthy individuals steer these corporations, maintaining relations with corrupt government officials in order to win contracts and uphold their dominance. As capital increasingly flows into these companies' coffers, income and wealth inequality gradually worsen. These are all things that have been happening in the Chinese economy over the past couple of decades, but this recent Chinese history is highly reminiscent of the Gilded Age of the United States in the late 19th and early 20th century. This is the basis for University of Michigan professor Yuan Yuan Ang's recent book, China's Gilded Age, which takes a deep look at the endemic corruption currently plaguing Chinese society. But recent developments in China indicate that China, just as the USA did around 100 years ago, may be emerging from its Gilded Age into a new progressive era. In her book, Ang breaks down the corruption in Chinese society into four different categories. Petty theft, grand theft, speed money, and access money. Petty and grand theft are what they sound like. Petty theft could be an official simply using their power to extort money by, say, setting up a roadblock and charging a fee for cars to pass. With grand theft, an official with access to government funds may siphon millions into a Swiss bank account. Speed money, on the other hand, occurs when an official allows an individual to move past red tape for a fee. But the form of corruption that Ong focuses most on is access money, essentially the money that private players like corporations use in order to gain favorable treatment from the government, allowing them to procure contracts and other benefits that come from having friends in high places. Access money has become a key part of China's economy, and a main takeaway from Ong's book is that in China, corporations' use of access money has actually fueled economic growth. The catch is that it's unbalanced, risky, and often artificial growth. To explain how this happens, Ong focuses on the real estate sector as the most important example. In China, the state owns all land, and leases it out to be used. Real estate developers have in recent years been able to make lots of money buying land from the government cheaply, and then turning around and renting it out themselves at higher prices. Government officials go along with this, because they often receive hefty kickbacks from the developers, access money. This collusion has led to runaway investment and speculation on real estate which has benefited both officials and businesses, but has also led to China's infamous tendency toward overinvestment in infrastructure that will not produce any value down the line. Think ghost cities. This is where the economic growth becomes artificial and risky. The U.S. eventually found its way out of its own Gilded Age and legislation from 1900 to 1960, six decades of relative political progressivism, tended to emphasize the importance of restraining private corporate power on behalf of the common citizen. In the past few months, the Chinese Communist Party has moved in a similarly progressive direction, slapping a 2.8 billion U.S. dollar fine on tech giant Alibaba for monopolistic practices, halting the planned IPO of Ant Financial cracking down on speculation on housing, requiring all after-school tutoring programs to become nonprofits, and even ramping up pressure on the wealthy to voluntarily donate some of their own money in what the party calls tertiary distribution. It's not clear yet if these changes will lead to a meaningful decrease in wealth and income inequality in China, or if it's a lot of hot air. But if these announcements are followed up by meaningful enforcement on a broad scale, the changes could lead to improved livelihoods for China's middle class and a decrease to the stark wealth inequality that has gradually grown in China since it began reform and opening up in the 1970s. This wouldn't be unprecedented. In the US, after Teddy Roosevelt cracked down on monopolistic practices and Franklin Roosevelt beefed up the welfare state and levied high taxes on the wealthy, the American middle class saw a serious boost to its standards of living, a more equitable society in the coming years and decades. This shift alone wouldn't be enough to allow China to replace the U.S. as a hegemonic world power. U.S. military strength, its extensive alliance network, and China's contentious relations with its neighbors and its own domestic resource insecurities are other major challenges China would have to address. But if the reforms like the ones we've seen this summer prove meaningful in the long term, it could certainly increase China's esteem abroad, at a time when public opinion in many countries sees China unfavorably. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, please leave a like and subscribe. Uh, check out other videos on Chinese politics and society on my channel.